good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm not sure if the, if the mic and the speaker helps or hurts, but I'll, I will use it. And um, I'll tell the panelists that, as you can see, you have to be quite close to it to make it work. Um, we're saving up to get better mics. Um, but in any event, my, my great pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon. My name is Bill Poole. I'm Executive Director here at the Canadian Clay and Glass Gallery. And um, delighted to have you all here for what's going to be a really, really exciting, exciting afternoon, both here and at RARE. I'd like to start by um, thanking the sponsors of the exhibition that's in place at the moment, Exquisite Woods. And they are the Musagetti's Fund, uh, held at the Kitchener and Waterloo Community Foundation, and Hefner Lexus. Uh, then I would also like to thank the sponsors of this afternoon's event, which as you know is Exquisite Woods, Art Rooted in Science. And they are, once again, the Musagetti's Fund at the uh, KWCF, held at the KWCF, and PW Capital Inc. So we're indebted to them for helping us to make this happen. Um, I, I'd like to actually recognize a few people who are here, if I may. Jan Dai, our board chair. Um, and um, I'd also like to uh, recognize uh, Valerie Hall, um, who was really one of our, uh, really our main um, partner in, in pulling this uh, event together, along with Shelley Crawford, our director of development. And uh, I must say, Shelley, this idea of connecting these dots between the clay and glass and rare occurred to Shelley as soon as Christian Singer mentioned this exhibition to all of us uh, months and months ago. So, and then when we got together with Valerie a few weeks ago, it all came together really well. And we're very, very grateful to everyone who has helped to support this event. Um, and one of the wonderful things about this, uh, bringing together the two organizations, the Canadian Clay and Glass Gallery and the Rare Charitable Research Reserve, is that we're bringing together our two communities represented here this afternoon to explore the ways in which art and science are interconnected and overlap and inform each other and that sort of thing. And the panelists will help us uh, in our understanding of all that. And I, my hope is uh, that, it's, uh, that this will be the first of many collaborations because you know, we refer to ourselves in terms of clay and glass as those being silica-based media. So we're very much what's on the walls and uh, on the plinths is very much from the earth. And so I think there's a, an obvious kinship with rare and, uh, and the world that it examines, explores, and helps to explain to all of us. So um, again, welcome to everyone. Welcome to the panelists. And I'd now like to introduce my colleague, uh, uh, Sheila McMath, uh, curator of the Canadian Clay and Glass Gallery. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for coming this afternoon to hear from the panelists we have assembled here. Paula Murray, Karen Huell, and Doug Larson, and our facilitator, uh, Dr. Stephanie sobeck Swent, the executive director at the Rare Charitable Research Reserve. Um, Stephanie and I have enjoyed the planning conversations uh, with each of the panelists that have led to this moment. Um, and I'm certain that the sharing of ideas this afternoon will be informative, provocative, and uninspiring. Um, each of the panelists have prepared a brief statement to give you, the audience, a grounding in their work. And we'll hear about concrete examples of inquiry, scholarship, experimentation, and collaboration among disciplines. Um, after the short statements, Stephanie will start the conversation, um, and then we will open it up to the floor. Um, I'm sure there's lots of, there'll be lots of questions from the audience as well. So just uh, brief introductions for each one of our, uh, our speakers. Um, Paula Murray, our first speaker, uh, is a distinguished artist, Royal Canadian Academy of the Arts member, whose path from science to ceramics has produced the intricate and beautiful work that we have displayed here. Paula will speak about the intimate sensory knowledge that ceramic artists possess, and she will also speak about the power of art to encourage stillness, contemplation, respect for nature, and a desire to protect it. And Karen Huell, our second speaker, is an associate professor of philosophy at the University of Guelph, and Karen's practice involves asking philosophical questions across disciplines, across disciplines, including political theory, ethics, environmental philosophy, 
and feminist thought. And Karen plans to speak today about the links between ecology and health, and also to tell us about the concept of linguistic justice. Doug Larson is an award-winning scientist, author, lecturer, instrument maker, and musician, and now an emeritus professor at the University of Guelph. He spends his time lecturing about the union of science and art, and uses, the storyteller, uses his storyteller guitar as the touchstone to his philosophy. And our facilitator, Dr. Stephanie sobek swent is an internationally trained biodiversity researcher. Since coming to Canada, she's held research positions at the University of Waterloo and Western, and most recently taught as an assistant professor at Ryerson University. And Stephanie has been the executive director at RARE since January 2014. Yeah, okay. Um, thanks to everyone for coming this afternoon, and I think it's time to get started. We'll pass, I'll pass the torch to Paula, our first speaker. It's really lovely to see see all you folks. It's uh, really a delight to be back down in uh, in this neck of the woods. I come from uh, Chelsea Wakefield area. I don't know. You might have heard of Meech Lake. It's kind of it was a quiet little place for a while, but uh, that's that's where I uh, hail from. And I was here for a week and a half. Uh, a couple of months ago now to install this exhibition. So this is, is my work here in porcelain. And um, I'm really delighted that Sheila uh, asked me to be part of this panel. I guess she's uh, aware that I'm interested in building bridges. And uh, the bridge between science and, and art to me is, is one that's very, very close to my heart. So to open the discussion, I wanted to talk about my understanding uh, that um, of the cont contribution that art makes to the world. And then I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, some of the ideas that went into the, the creation of this particular work. And we'll go from there. So um, I guess I, I really do feel that there's a, so much common ground between art and science because fundamentally it's all about asking questions uh, about our curiosity, about exploring uh, a reality, our, our understanding of reality. And so thanks to science, our, our knowledge base has exploded in the past couple of hundred years. And the scientific method that we apply to test that knowledge can be tested against a hard physical reality. And that's just been you know, a, a phenomenal gift to the world and our progress. But I also appreciate that not all sciences uh, really benefit uh, from that system, you know, not, not everything can be tested against a physical reality, and so some, some suffer. Um, so with the onslaught of this scientific method, I believe that we've really lost touch with some of our traditional no ways of knowing and seeking truth, uh, ways that we might not fully understand but have traditionally been part of the richness of our reality and, and have subsequently been marginalized. So I, I believe that art brings to bear other ways of, of knowing, um, it reflects truth, imagination, our fragility, our endeavors, uh, reveals and um, reflects back to us the human condition. And so I think one of the most important contributions that art can make to the world is to uh, awaken our soul. Um, science moves forward because of our questions, but if our soul is not engaged when we ask those questions, then I believe that we can be led astray. And uh, it's how, how we choose those questions. So I think art, art brings that kind of question to uh, the, the public discourse. So uh, again, I guess I would sum that up to say that I believe that the search for truth or a deeper understanding of the world around us uh, transcends the dichotomies that uh, we often place things in. We often polarize things and, and place things into opposing camps, whereas I feel that they're very complementary to each other. As, as they're both really trying to seek a deeper understanding. So my education started in science. I studied uh, the hard sciences at Ottawa U for a few years, and I was wondering if I was on the right path, and uh, I always had a lot of questions. Um, uh, my, I can't say that I always really trusted my head. I tended to trust my instincts and my gut. I learned from an early age that you can't always trust the mind. Uh, my mom was bipolar, so she had been hospitalized more times than I could count. And so it was, um, I had, you know, and science to me was a bit of a revolving door of, of you know, in her life anyway, how, how things were at that, at that time. So, 
you know, that fundamentally probably, you know, was a, a major formation for me to, to really question and, and be interested in the, the relationship between the mind and the body or physical and spiritual realms. So uh, fortunate for me at the university, I kind of stumbled into a pottery studio and I was just really struck by the visceral reaction to the material. And, uh, and decided to follow it, follow, follow my gut, follow my instincts. And so it wasn't that I went in thinking about art. It was more just I was probably young and confused and searching and, and, uh, and started working with clay. But f lucky for me, my grounding in science uh, really opened up the doors of possibility of looking at these materials in their very elemental way. And so I, from early on, I started combining uh, firing techniques and, and, uh, and forming processes in ways that you know, weren't traditional, but a way that I could really respond to, to my material. Um, so a lot of this work is about cracks and movement in clay, uh, can speak about fragility. Uh, it was a vocabulary that, again, I guess I kind of stumbled into it, but perhaps it was my openness to the material and that really uh, rootedness in process to express meaning uh, that, that I responded and found I could start to talk about things that I, I wasn't even really aware of, but that kind of trickled up to the surface uh, just through the work. And that was, I was doing a, a sculpture for Ottawa City Hall and I was combining fiberglass and clay just to, um, to solve a, a technical problem. So I achieved that problem, but I had this damn cracking problem to, to figure out what to do with. And, uh, and I just thought it evoked such a powerful visual language that I wanted to explore. And so I've been exploring that since the, since the uh, early 90s. And um, so it's a, it's a research that I have pursued. Um, it's a, um, what was I going to say? Uh, I guess maybe I'll just start with with talking about this initial bowl that's the, that's the starting piece for this uh, installation. So a, a bowl for us is one of those iconic forms that speaks to the, the very first clay. Uh, when you're in ceramics, you just have so much history to draw on. You know, earliest ceramics was 26,000 years. It's, it's, it's a long, long time ago. Um, we have the whole geological history that, that clay is actually the erosion of granite and felspar and that more clay is being made every moment than we will ever have time to, to make things out of it. So I really love that humble connection to this kind of material and uh, the fact that it's so prevalent and, and it's the ground that we walk on. Um, and then there's also that, that cultural history to think that it's man's first synthetic, the first time that man synthesized two elements, the alumina and the silica together to uh, to form another material, and that that material recorded their activities, and we understood what they're all about because of gluing those shards back together. So in, in this work that I'm doing with glass and fiberglass, uh, physically what's happening is that the clay is losing its water plasticity and it's shrinking, and by juxtaposing it with fiberglass that does not want to or doesn't have water in it, uh, the tension between those two can, can uh, evoke all of these patterns and cracks um, that are speaking about, to me, I can see all sorts of metaphors for the human condition. Um, so when I look in that bowl, I can see the fragility of the earth, the precarious nature of, of the world that we, are, that we find ourselves in today and how we have to, to take great care or it can fall apart if you sneeze. <laughs> um, the, uh, or water erosion, you know, all sorts of uh, those kind of images. Uh, Clay was also, you know, a material that the cuneiform language was written in, in Mesopotamia, you know, 4,000 years ago. So if someone was selling 12 camels to the next uh, town, it was written in clay and fired, and it was 12 camels. It wasn't going to change. So I've made these into scrolls, and so thinking about scrolls right now, we're just scrolling through reams and reams and reams of in information that can change, uh, you know, with a click of a mouse, but something in clay is, is there and is clear. So in this process, when these cracks uh, appear in the work, 
to me, it's very symbolic of a language that I'm trying to understand, trying to decode, trying to say what is it that it's saying. So I've created this bridge moving from the earth up into the sky. That's uh, speaking of ancient times, ancient wisdom that has been passed down over time, perhaps leaving behind uh, knowledge that doesn't serve us anymore, new ideas as new ideas come along that we need to, to let go of old patterns of thinking. Um, and moving towards the, the piece at the end I call peace studies, so it's very much about uh, my, my feeling that the more deeply and more profoundly we understand how interconnected everything is in the world, whether it's on a microscopic level or a macroscopic level, that that's how we're going to move forward. So to, again, to, to get away from the false dichotomies that we often place our arguments in to, uh, to understand how complementary everything is. So I guess that about does it for my opening remarks of where I'm coming from, but um, I look forward to chatting with you. All right, I think I can come in. Hi, everyone. So my name is Karen Houle, and uh, I'm uh, a scientist by my background, and I am a philosopher now, but I'm also a poet. Um, so those three things come together. Um, after time, they didn't always come together. Um, so I was going to speak to you today about uh, my methodology for writing poetry. Uh, in particular, how I had to figure out how to write poetry when I was living at North House on Rare and uh, try to integrate in a, a profound way rather than a superficial or a cheap way, science and art. Um, and so this was something that I basically grappled with and then came up with. Uh, for how to integrate science and art together. Um, so I'm going to speak about that. Um, hopefully there will be some things that you find interesting and then we can talk more about it later. I'm happy to hear your questions. And I might have some time for a poem, but Stephanie will let me know. All right, so first about science. Um, so I used to be married to an Iranian, and he told me a story once that I'll never forget. A true story. That was um, when the Iranian revolution started, um, the Pahlavi dynasty that was in power, they did what a lot of fleeing dynasties do, which is they tried to destroy the evidence. And they uh, shredded thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of documents. And uh, what, my, uh, what my partner at the time told me is that after the revolution, um, individuals that were in the service of the revolution uh, were put in charge of the work of going to those rooms with those, you can imagine the size of those shredder bags, and putting the documents back together. A decade to do so and hundreds and hundreds of bodies, but that's the work that was um, considered to be a crucial component of understanding what had passed before and moving ahead. So the connection between that um, incredible story and what I'm going to say is that when I think about science, that's what I think about science as doing. I have an image of scientists, people who do field work. Um, Stephanie's done field work. Doug's done field work. Um, people who do it for 20, 30, 40 years, day after day in the mud, in the rain, in the same site with their uh, rubber boots and their samplers. I, I think of science in that kind of unbelievable sense that uh, they're working in the natural world and the natural world is uh, a thousand million fragments of different size that they're attempting to put together in some way to make sense of and um, to look for patterns in what otherwise just seems like a jumble of discrete bits of um, material or song um, and it's hand and eye work and there's an incredible painstakingness to it um, there's a kind of devotion that I see in um, scientific work um, that's almost overwhelming. I know a little bit about that from doing field work, and others can speak to it more, but I, I sometimes imagine it's like you, you just make what's called a breakthrough, and you make an association, or you see something, or you discover something, and you know behind that there's rooms and rooms and rooms of more bits that could fit in this somehow into this larger puzzle. Um, at larger scales and smaller scales. So I really don't know how one 
uh, buckles down and does that work, just like I don't know how the people in the Revolutionary Guard buckled down and did that work, but the amazing thing is it gets done. Um, so I have, uh, at sort of base level, this incredible respect for that kind of painstaking labor of trying to understand and make sense out of fragments and bits, and to continue to move forward in that um, overwhelming and really infinite task you know, on behalf of others to make sense of what has come before and what might come after. So that's um, part of what I understand as something that scientists do and offer the rest of us who don't do that work. Um, and so in my work as a, as a philosopher, but also as a writer, I want to borrow uh, directly from scientists and from science um, in the sense that I, I think that um, Scientists show us a certain level of precision and detail about the uh, natural world. Um, it's true also of ceramicists. Anyone who works with their hands and eyes that much over time uh, knows something that those of us who don't do that with our hands and eyes don't know. Um, and so I, in my poetry work, I want to borrow di directly from science in the scientific world and the things it has come to know about how things stand to one another. Um, so how that looks in, in um, concrete practice is it's twofold, actually, for my poetry work. So the first thing that I decided to do, um, took a couple weeks to decide on this, but I asked um, for basically uh, whatever and whatever topic of scientific paper that had been published um, based on work that was done on the rare property. Um, so, for example, and then, so I, I just got delivered these random pile of um, papers. One of them is in the British Mycology Society, reclassification of butternut cankis, canker fungus. Another one is on ephemeral stream sensor design. Another one is on spatial variability in stochastic community assembly. Another one is on predation. And another one is hybridization in uh, native apple, for instance. So, if you can imagine, my first gesture is to um, read the work that has been done to collect these sort of fragments of meaning from the space that is that 900 acres, not some 100 acres in Meech Lake or somewhere up in Halliburton, but where I was. And the people that had spent five years, 10 years, 20 years on that ground looking day after day, uh, trying to find patterns, archaeological patterns, historical patterns, stream patterns, weather patterns, plant patterns. So that was the first move, um, to sort of take a fast track to the precision and the detail by relying on the scientific um, insights. But then the second thing is, um, this wasn't something I was able to do in all cases, but I was able to do it in some cases, is then I called the scientists. And I said, can we please go for a walk and show me where those trees are? And we'll look at those trees and, or I want you to, is that the stream head that you're talking about? Is this it right here? And go out in crappy weather or cold and actually ask sort of what they do and get them to point at the material objects that these papers are the upshot of. So there's two ways that I wanted to have a kind of direct encounter with science and scientific work on the property. And uh, I have to thank all the folks at RARE who um, accommodated that request on my behalf. But I thought that that was a way to honor the place that I was at and the kinds of hands and eyes that had spent more time than I had in that space and time to see it. So um, walking the property and kind of my pen in my hand, but it was usually too cold, so I was just thinking in my head. <laughs> so I would say that those are the, um, the sort of positive input, inputs and my way as an artist of trying to honor what science makes available. Um, but then there's some cautionary notes. Um, and the cautionary notes have to do with uh, largely language and language use. So this is where the arts part comes back in or cycles back around. So one of the things that I think is true of scientific discourse, and I say it's true because I was involved in it, but also I read it, is um, one of the basic impulses in science is to try to say how X is like Y. You know, you're studying this creek, but to get oriented to it, you say, it's sort of like this creek, and it's like this creek, and there's a question we had about this creek, and there's some information about this one, and so let's try to bring the thing that I'm interested in into conversations with these other things that are like it. 
there's nothing evil about this gesture, but it's a really important thing to notice that one of the things that science does is it tries to generalize, it tries to universalize as a way of making sense. It says this isn't just a stream unlike any other, it's a stream that I can ask a question of that was like the question I asked of another stream in Mitch Lake or Halliburton. Um, so that's one observation. And um, the concern that I would have as an, as an artist, but I think this is a concern that we should all have, is that that kind of gesture knocks the edges off singularity. In other words, things are both in an interesting way able to be part of a pattern and generalized, but at the same time, nothing is like anything else. Think of a child that you have. The child is not like the next child. It can be described that way, but there's a way in which things are radically unique and singular, and we have to have practices in language and practices in vision that remind us of that singularity. And one of the dangers or the cautions, I think, that we need to have about um, working with the scientific, whether it's a methodology or um, just its language styles, is it tends to reach for universals and generalizations, and we can lose the particular in that. And what's important about that is, well, think about how you love something. You don't love anything in general. You love things in particular. And it might be that the love or, that we have in us that can be directed toward the natural world as Paula said, a kind of spirit, it needs to know what the individual is. We love individual things very powerfully. So um, a caution there is about scientific language, sort of inculcating in us, in all of us, kind of flat eyes, I would call it. Um, loss of the ability to pick out what is unique about the thing, or maybe just the uniqueness of the thing receding in the background as we try to put things together and see how they're alike. Um, and another way of putting that is that um, scientific language tends to disambiguate. It's really committed to precision and isn't comfortable leaving things kind of floppy or gray area or poetic, as they would say. So I know from trying to publish philosophical say, papers in logic or philosophy of science, one of the criticisms that will come back to me is this language is too flowery, it's too poetic. And the aim is to disambiguate, to just say exactly what you mean and, and know gray areas. Um, so again, that's not an evil thing, it's just, I think, a feature of scientific language is it's laser beam precision. It's not terribly playful, it's very serious, um, which can be a good thing or a bad thing. So now I'm just going to turn to say a few things about poetry and poetic practice. <laughs> as a, I wouldn't say so much an antidote as maybe two elements that when put together in this way like silica and alumina, there can be a synergy that's really incredible. Um, but one needs to be tempered by the other. So the remarks I wanted to make about poetry is that how I think of poetry, it's language-based meaning building. And in that sense, I call myself a poet because I happen to publish poetry, but every one of us who uses words, which is every single one of us, is in some way a language user and therefore these Remarks that I make apply as much to you as they do to me. So one of the things that poetry does very, very well is it listens, or the poetic ear, which is a kind of musical ear. It's not an ear, that, it's not a perceptual capacity that's dominated by the eyes. It's also got the ears, it's got rhythm, it's got touch. Those are the capacities that we can use. Um, so a poet or somebody who has a poetic inclination um, can listen past or through the data and the findings or the objective truths and hear again the big questions that are actually animating this kind of work in the first place. So I think one of the things that does happen maybe too easily, and you can certainly speak to it from working more directly in the sciences, there's, a, there's a, a, a way in which you start with a big question or there's a big question in the background or something you really care about that you might be a bit shy. You're not gonna put that in the paper. It's gonna stay in the background. Your heart's gonna stay in the background. And poetry is a very, gives us, I think, license, all of us, to again, listen past the data and to remember what the big questions are that are actually animating this work in the first place, which is meaning making and finding connections and articulating them in ways that are beautiful. Um, and I found um, when, I was, when I was working uh, at North House and reading these articles 
I was reading both as a, a person interested in the scientific details, but also reading as a language uh, sleuth, looking for the places in this discourse itself where there were these kind of floppy holes or these gray areas where the words themselves were incredibly poetic. And for a second, they didn't just mean that, they also meant many other possible things. Uh, so I think of it as kind of holes going out laterally through um, science. So one of the examples that I think I asked Stephanie about, there was a term called jackknifing the data. And I suppose if I wasn't a poet, I would just move right past that and know what that meant. But jackknifing the data for me instantly was a number of other very beautiful associative possibilities. Another one was in um, Andrew McDougall's work. He talks about cafeteria trials with the rodents. And I just started laughing when I was reading that. It's like cafeteria trials, where you put out little dishes to see what the, which rodents eat what. So that word itself that's sitting in an otherwise quite serious paper was full of playfulness and other possibilities. So I've pulled those and put them back into my, um, my writing. Okay, I'll two, say two other things shortly. <clears throat> this is just a very quick headliner, and you can ask me more about it if it's of interest to you. But... Um, a French philosopher I like very much named Michel Serre, he said, language, your job is to write the world, not write about the world. <sighs> write the world. Don't write about the world. And what he means by that, and it's a view that I 100% endorse, is that language and words and concepts and ideas, they're just as real as apples and pine trees and mercury and silica. We think of them somehow as being ephemeral or not having reality, but words are real, and putting words together makes real systems in the world. It's as much of the world. It's not just a description of the world. It's a participation in the world. And there's a lot that follows from that, a lot about responsibility for how you put words together. There's not a neutral space where you just talk about things. The things that you're using to talk about them are things themselves. So one of the things that really matters to me is thinking about language as an ecologist thinks about trees and escarpment, is that you can see discourses or poems or newspaper articles, and with the right ecological sensitivity, you can see that, for instance, one kind of language has come to dominate. Just the way if you're in a, an ecosystem and you have the right eyes, you can say an alien species has come to dominate or that there should be a balance between predator and prey in this system, but it's top prey, it's dominated by predators. There's an unbalance in this ecological system. And I think exactly those same kinds of questions can be asked about words and language and sentences. And poetry does this incredible thing of maybe not telling us it's doing that, but showing us what ecologies of language that are healthy ecologies actually feel and look like. And that's a question that ecologists wonder. What does a healthy ecosystem look like? And I think we should be looking everywhere for possible answers. And one of them is language systems. Okay, the last thing that I'm going to say is that um, poetic language, or using poetic language, is using language in careful ways. Um, not being afraid to be playful, not being afraid to be ambiguous, um, even being deliberately so at times, is... I'm not going to use the word weapon. I'm going to say maybe sort of a bulwark against the ways that language can be ugly, unsustainable, destructive, um, and even deadening in that sense of like flattening our sensitivity. Um, and so I, I think it has a capacity to reanimate this power of seeing X as X, seeing things on their own terms. Um, in a funny way, just because it uses language, it lets language slide. And because it lets language slide, it lets things inside us slide so that we can see things from different angles. I guess that's the way I see it. So I'll just give you some, um, just a couple pairs of words, and you can see right away how this is true. The word seed it can be C-E-D-E. -E. It can be S-E-E-D. You don't know which one it is. It's both for a while. Or the word bark. With the word I said to my um, partner this morning, I really like our dog's size. He said, I can't stand when she whines. I said, no, no, that she's little. <laughs> and so there's a, the, the way that language is always ready to kind of explode and disorient us 
um, is I think this really beautiful moment that is a little bit of a bulwark against our otherwise in um, inclination to be overly serious and precise. And um, I think that we have a huge debt to the natural world for this. And if we really even try to think of the way that all of our metaphors and qualitative descriptions, they really come from the world itself, the material world itself. And I think by using language poetically with an eye to how things are in the world from science, it's, it's a really powerful way to reanimate all of it. So the metaphor I was gonna leave you with, this is actually true, is um, my daughter Kusta had a baby yesterday, true. And I was thinking when I was driving over here, I might not be able to go down to Indian woods. And I was gonna tell you, because the baby isn't out of the woods yet. And we could use that phrase and we sort of know what it means, to, but to actually reinsert that phrase into the woods and into a child, like it, it makes things move again inside us. So that could be a flat phrase you could say, you know, oh, you know, the, Raptors aren't out of the woods yet. But to go, we're going to the woods. And then to actually be in that place and have that word to not be out of the woods yet, it's going to make the woods feel different and it's going to make our language different again. So I wanted to leave you with that truth. Thanks, everyone. Thanks uh, for having me today. Um, if you look at the panel, you'll see that I represent a different demographic. And I also represent the group of people who are now officially um, parasites on society. So I thank you all for working. Keep doing it. We need your pension contributions. I'm doing my best to spend it as rapidly as I can before my kids get their greedy little hands on it. Uh, I started working at the University of Guelph when I was 25. And I quit when I was 60 after having figured out that I couldn't do anything better in that field between 60 and the end than I had already done, so I decided to try to start working on things that I really was bad at. And I think um, throughout our lives, we tend to spend our, our hours during the workday waiting to get to those fun things at nighttime, whether it's child-related or hobby-related. And I always liked building instruments, and most of the things that I did for work and for fun were based on something I learned when I was 25, and that is that the uh, scientist and philosopher and mathematician Jacob Bernowski did a TV series back in the mid-60s called The Ascent of Man. Uh, these days, to be politically correct, it would probably be called The Ascent of People or The Ascent of Persons or something equally non-poetic. Uh, one of the features of that series was his observation that the Holocaust was brought to us by people whose conception of correctness, whose conception of right, excluded all other perceptions that were considered by others to be valid. And he demonstrated this in a film in which he showed that those who argue for a distinct difference between the arts and the sciences know neither that art requires the same sort of discipline that science is reported to have, and science requires as much creativity as you often assign to those who are engaged in the arts. And it's because in a scientific venue, you have to freely imagine a truth that has never been shown on paper to be even considered. And you then run about as best you can to prove that your concept is completely wrong. And if you fail to show that your concept is completely wrong, then you publish a paper saying that it might be right. That, that concept of tolerant, critical thinking is at the core of science, but it's at the core of art as well. And Jacob Bernowski taught me how to teach, he taught me how to think, and most recently he's taught me how to build guitars. Uh, I'm going to keep my comments very short because one of the features when you get old like I am is that uh, you repeat yourself. So rather than telling you the stories that are in the book that I've written about these kinds of concepts, I brought a copy with me for everyone here. I just recently bought a big batch of them from the publisher who was trying to empty his warehouse. So I've got a, a case of books over there. I'd like, I'm giving you all an assignment, actually. I would like you all to flip through the book without making it appear that you've read it and then give it to either a child 
or a grandchild. This book was written for young people. I included in this book uh, the comment that dogma is one of the most dangerous things that's now infused through our society, whether it's religious dogma, the dogma that art and science are distinct, uh, cultural dogma, any sort of dogma is something that I absolutely despise. Even my dogma that I hate dogma is something that I despise. I'm not sure how to get out of that loop. But in any event, since uh, at least 400 people have so far read this book, what I'd like to do is to give you all the assignment of taking the copy of the book, reading it gently, and then giving it to a kid so that the ideas that I've already said and that I'm not going to repeat today can be understood by that person. Also, I'm a musician, and I brought 30 copies of the album that just got, uh, I just got back from the press two weeks ago. It's called Things That Need To Be Said. This is actually in my view, 12 well-disguised lectures. It's actually 12 rock and roll songs, but don't tell the kids that. And I want everybody here to promise me that they'll, this, by the way, there's a digital download card. You don't have to have a record player. You don't, for those of you who've gotten rid of your record players, it's not too late. Many of the comments, many of the lyrics, many of the ideas in the songs follow the same thing. Again, I'm repeating myself because I'm old. That is, that dogma is a dangerous thing for uh, the future of humanity. So in addition to finding a young person to give the copy of the book to, I would ask you to find a young person to give a copy of the record to. Tell them what a record player is, in case they've never heard of one. But the digital download card uh, will give them access to it on, on the computer. And there's a website so that if I run out of copies, I brought 30 copies of the record, and I'm not sure that it's going to be enough for absolutely everybody. Uh, I am selling it. But because I'm a parasite in society, I'm really just already sucking the money out of you anyway. So I really don't want money for it. I want songs to be listened to. And I want to, I want to infiltrate the brains of young people so that this idea that dogma is dangerous can get into them without them knowing that an adult told them that. <laughs> so that's my contribution today. Thank you very much. if you speak to people who are not really engaged with either science and arts, now that we have really learned and seen good examples how the two play really well together, you will, you will often find that people think they are really polar opposites and they are the disciplines that go not well together. In fact, we even often say it's an art, it's not a science. So why do you think is this so deeply ingrained in many people? What are, what are, where's this thinking coming from? It's easy. It's much harder to try to put things together than it is to have them disarticulated the way Karen just described. It's much easier for a sculptor to say they just work in clay or glass or whatever. The, the attempt to integrate media is harder. And what's more, it's a, it's a difficulty that isn't always easy to see for your audience. So, Paul, I'm, I suspect that you find that people don't know what was required skill-wise to produce this. They just look at it and say, <laughs> Oh, she must have squeezed it out of a tooth. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. So it's, it's, it's harder. Plus, it's comforting to believe in rightness. Jacob Bernowski pointed out that the Nazis got away with what they did because they created a comfort zone that was so nurturing and so internally self-supportive that they didn't have to. They didn't have to admit weakness. They didn't have to admit the need to listen to another conflicting point of view. Um, whether it's Christianity or Islam, uh, in the history of religions, what makes people uncomfortable is having their faith challenged. Yeah, I think it's interesting, and if you go really far back in history, you will find it used to be different, because I found this really good quote by Leonardo da Vinci himself, who apparently said that art is the queen of all sciences, communicating knowledge to all generations of the world. And what I find interesting too, if you look at children, for example, I always say everyone is born a scientist because they have this nature of inquiry really deeply ingrained and they ask all the right questions. They are interested in everything. They take every material and build something out of it and put all their fantasies in there. It can, a cardboard box can be anything. So where is this getting lost and what can every one of us do to, to keep that in their lives more? You know, mm -hmm. be more interested in 
like feeling okay that you don't know the answer. And I think that's a very uncomfortable place that, that we don't like to be as a society. We like to, it always really gets me when people talk up and they're talking as if they know what they're talking about. <laughs> I think there's another way of saying that. There's much more joy to be had in not knowing than knowing. Once you know something, you sort of put it in a box. Okay, I, that's done. But it's the joy of discovery that comes from admitting at the beginning that you don't know. And that's way more fun. When I actually built my first instrument, and I thought it sort of looked like a guitar, I was thrilled until I took it to my friend Mark Stutman, who owns Folkway Music. He said, and I've written this in the book, he said, well, it has approximately the shape of it. <laughs> <laughs> Great, interesting. So rare in this exhibition, the Exquisite Woods exhibition, it's all about the connectivity and about the complex relationships that we find between humans and the natural world and the environment. And a lot of teaching is being done in schools about the environment and that it needs to be protected and about all the threats to biodiversity. But yet again, it just seems that the message is never coming across really to most people and, and that the, the mature adult, again, just loses interest or loses connectivity to the connectivity they should have to the natural world. So do you think art can really be a good tool to communicate this better? Yes. I found it interesting in, in talking, you spoke so much about the eloquence of words and how they can bring everyone in. Not everyone does respond well to words. They get, mm -hmm. you know, uh, overwhelmed with words. And so I think art can bring other ways. You, you did mention how our tactile senses, our auditory senses, our musical senses are ways that we know about the world too. And I think that's, that's where the arts can, can point us in those directions. And you were talking about the individual nature within the collective. And this piece on the wall I call sanctuary. And it, it is really wonderful when you, when you bring your work out of the studio and you get people to respond to it and see what they see. And they just love the fact that each one of those trees is an individual specimen, that it each has its own language, that it each has its own rhythm, but, then, but their strength is within the collective. It's within that, that larger group, but to rec they, they really recognize that they, every, every tree has a role to play in the, in the group. It, they all have their own voice. You know, a drop in the ocean is going to evaporate if it's not in the ocean, but when it gets in the ocean, it becomes the ocean. And it's just, um, I, I, think, I think the arts are a way to engage our other senses to, to help us recognize those universal truths. There are about 200 students in the class, and they're largely science students, biology, engineering, uh, landscape architect students, a few students who identify as coming from the arts, the humanities. Um, and there's only one unit on aesthetics, and it comes at the end. That's a sort of cla I think that's a sort of classic indicative that maybe arts, poetry, aesthetics, music, ceramics, dance, they have a role to play, but a, a very secondary, supportive, even entertainment role. And that's, I think that that really needs to be challenged. So if that would mean putting it in the front or putting more of it in. And also um, thinking about the arts and aesthetics as not necessarily being a poet or a ceramicist or a musician, but somebody who is letting their perceptual self be immersed in the world, whether it's with your eyes or your ears. I mean, we're all musicians first. Our hearts, they have rhythm. The last thing we do is we make a sound with our lungs. That's what I think when I think of art. It's just a non-cognitive way of being in the world. It's sound, it's touch, it's smell, it's taste, it's color. Um, so I think that that's also a real challenge in our education to not make art seem like something that's just esoteric or difficult. It's what we all already are. It's our perceptual selves in the world, like children. Um, so that's one thing. I had the incredible luck of, um, so my background is in science, I have a chemistry and biology degree, and then I went away for a while and I realized the thing that gives me joy, to use Doug's word, is philosophy. It just animates me, it fills me with crazy excitement. Maybe when you see that ceramic, you know, you say you happened upon it. And the University of Guelph uh, 
a while ago, uh, had uh, in their master's program, they allowed one student in who had no background in philosophy. It's like, kind of, just take a risk. And I was able to enter that program having no background. Not easy, as Doug says, you have to really catch up. Going the other way too, if you go out of arts and go into the vet school, for instance, you really have to double it. Um, so I think it's really important for all of us that have any say in curricula to insist that those portals be left open. Uh, they don't have to be huge portals, but they have to be there for people to be able to move where their joy and passion um, happens. And that can be early childhood education, elementary school, middle school, but also university. If it wasn't for that, I'm sure that I wouldn't be able to do the work that I'm doing. It would have been great working with Doug in science, but I, I don't know if I'd find my way to philosophy as easily. I scared you away. No, not really. <laughs> I couldn't climb cliffs very well. All right, thanks. So one thing I'm interested in is we often say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? So is art more subjective compared to science? And is science the more objective science of things? And are they counterparts? Or how, how would you speak about the two? No. <laughs> I love it. Doc's answer is no. <laughs> so it's less black and white and it's, yeah. Yeah, it's a commonly sprayed bullshit. <laughs> well, a visual language isn't pinned down as tightly as language, but then I find words, as you say, can bring in all sorts of other images. So maybe we think that words really pin things down. Numbers pin things down more, perhaps, but uh, maybe, maybe, not. maybe that's, that's spin, so maybe that's a lot of what I'm talking about. In, Sorting out truth from spin. But, um, I can give a very simple example that we experienced in our lab. Um, we found the oldest trees in Canada. But for a while, the oldest tree we had was 997 years old. And the media didn't care less, nor did the public. As soon as we found the first tree that was over 1,000, uh, it was like the ceiling fell in from the snow level. Uh, suddenly, that number, for whatever reason, as irrational as it might be, yeah. Suddenly, it turns a switch, and uh, I become Mr. Old Guy. Anything to do with anything old, the media would phone. <laughs> old tiles, old ropes, it didn't matter what it was. I was on the list. Something over the, Doug, call him, call him. old stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll say something briefly about that, is that I, so of course you could describe Science is objective and cognitive, and art is aesthetic and immersive and non-cognitive. One is subjective, one is objective. But I'd like to just challenge us to suggest that the best way forward to be able to really see beauty in its truly complex depth, which isn't just something pleasing to the eye, and it's not just something pleasing to the ear. It's whatever the beauty is that's natural beauty, which is ugly and stinky and complex and we can't even get our minds around it. So if that's beauty... You listen to the record. Have I? <laughs> if that's beauty, which is not a... So whatever that is, that quality of existence, then the doesn't it seem to us that what we need to do is to be both very subjective and objective? In other words, to appreciate um, the qualities of the tree bark, to use an example that's over here knowing some things about trees, the names of the trees, the locations of the trees, the qualities of the trees, what's in the bark, um, whether it's toxic to other plants, uh, knowing its history about where those seeds came from and who carried it and by what animals. So cognitive dimensions of what's true about existence, or what we call in our conceptual, seems to really, you see things that you otherwise wouldn't see if you didn't have that knowledge. So I would say, you should, ideally know something about the history, about the scientific truth, about how the silica actually works at the molecular level. And that's going to take some training and some initiative. But on the other hand, you also want to be able to be touched or immersed or just moved by a color or a texture without having to think about what it means. And that takes another kind of training. The training in ambiguity and playfulness and touch and sensuality. Uh, so I would say that to actually 
be able to appreciate and then maybe produce beautiful works, whatever those are, you actually need both of them. Mm -hmm. And that the be I think that the future has to be individuals who have both of those capacities, whether they're in parliament or whether they're um, uh, janitors, it doesn't matter. I think that all of us have to commit to seeing that the way forward is for us to know what a thing is from a scientific historical basis mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. is also our jobs to know how to be moved by a thing, to school ourselves in being open to being moved by a thing in a non-cognitive way. That's really hard, but we can do it. I, I don't see separating them or thinking that it's the labor of the artist to be sensuous and dance around and the labor of the scientist to tell us how things really are. Each one of us, I think that's both of our work. And I know many, many people who embody that and I feel sad a lot of the time and despairing, but then when I think of that, shared labor, I think, ah, that's maybe, that's maybe gonna do it. Were there things that people in the audience wanted to ask? Yeah. <laughs> you talk about uh, poetry and science and as if, of course, could you stand up? Would you better? <laughs> <laughs> the ones behind you won't be able to I'm quite intrigued by the difference between poetry and science and art and science and so on. Um, I'm actually surprised when did the separation of poetry or, or arts and science uh, took place in history. In the 17th century and 18th century, the scientists used poetry to explain. Mm -hmm. So uh, what happened actually? There was a, uh, there used to be universal, uh, uh, universal education. education. Mm -hmm. Now we have science, we have music, we have this and we have that. It used to be together. Can anybody explain it? What happened? Or why we separated? I would say no. <laughs> <laughs> no one can explain it. it. It happened. Maybe it was the absence. You know, um, it had some toxic components. So who knows? I have, I have a theory. Go ahead. <laughs> I think technology, yes, it has something to do with the box. Because huh? if you remember the, the ancient naturalists sailing around the world making all these fantastic drawings of the species they would see. Or you can snap a single picture with your cell phone today. Similarly to the poetry, the easier it became to, to have vehicles for communication. I sometimes feel the more and more you would see this discrepancy between the two. I also have a, what, what uh, Doug said about, you know, just moving toward your joy. That's great advice, but my students, most of them have huge student loans. And they're worried about jobs, and their parents want them to be job ready when they leave university. And there's no space in that kind of a paradigm, an economic paradigm, for them to enjoy joy. They're stressed, so there's, an, there's partly an economic utilitarian, you've got to earn money because we have a huge debt load, because houses cost a lot, and how are you ever going to pay for your life? There's an economic thing that really will um, stop people's natural curiosity or inclination to walk away from a natural science degree into a poverty studio if there's too much anxiety around mm -hmm. um, money. There was somebody in the middle, the back, yes. <laughs> that was me. I just kept getting thoughts and ideas as all of you spoke. One of them related to the way people learn. Some people learn orally and some people learn verbally. Um, you can let me read something as, uh, in, related to instructions, but I'm learning a whole lot better if you show me how to do it. So mm -hmm. that, that plays a big part in how people respond to a whole lot of things. And then I, I really believe that creativity in the schools is still being quelched. Oh, um, you know, the one kid who does something differently, that's not the way it's supposed to be done. I remember when I was in grade five, which was a long time ago, and there wasn't the broad thinking that there might be today. We were doing a fracture drawing, you know how curly it is. And I decided to do mine geometrically. Well, of course, that's not what fracture is, but I wanted to do that. Well, 
man, did I get like I got a mark. That was wrong. Oh, totally wrong, yeah. yeah. But I did it anyway. Good for you. And then the <laughs> other thing that really troubles me today is the death of language. People today, they, <laughs> they don't know how to talk, even in the simplest way. So how, and I know I'm generalizing, but how are we going to um, have an experience the kinds of things that all of you are talking about, which are wonderful and, and quite frankly, I think <laughs> I can relate to, when some of them don't even know how to form a sentence. They don't know the meaning of all kinds of words. They use language incorrectly. And I'm not suggesting that's the job of artists or scientists, but it's a dilemma that I think affects so much of what has been said here today, which means that people lose so much. They miss out on so much in life and they aren't exposed to wonderful words. Anyway. The other thing is I think a lot of things have to be quantifiable in order to give them a mark or a niche or a place. And in quantifying things, we destroy so much. We don't believe enough gray areas to be explored. And anything that is gray doesn't get taught because it can't be given a mark. I must tell you that in retirement, there were two things that I have found the most joy from, and I suspect you're still suffering from this. One was applying for grants. I don't have to do that anymore. The other was marking. I hated having to mark. And now I don't have to. And if people wish to mark my book, that's their problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a professional dancer and a professional dance teacher. And I've been involved with uh, schools for 20 some years, teaching with uh, just my own dance, as been teaching choreography in uh, music, you know, the high school musicals and things like that. One of the most encouraging things uh, that I've seen in the last 20 years is programs like the Royal Conservatory of Music's Learning Through the Arts program. I don't, it, go home and Google it because it's a fantastic program. They take artists go into the schools and teach curriculum with their art. I mean, that's perfect because then it really is art and science together. And, for, and it's extremely um, enlightening for the school teachers who also, you know, they're, they're terrified. They're terrified of having to teach the dance curriculum. You know, they're supposed to teach these kids how, how to do things that I, you know, have degrees to do. And how, you know, you have all this work in pottery. They're supposed to be teaching kids that. So, and they're, so they're scared of it. That's one of the reasons why there's the two separate ends because you know, academics are afraid to go over to the art side and artists are kind of afraid to come over here into the academic side when they don't realize that they're, they're two together. But the kids now are being taught these methods, um, multiple intelligences and multiple learning styles. And it's very exciting to see a grade seven class learning multiples and factors by dancing them. And one of the biggest compliments in my entire career to date has been a grade seven teacher who came to me and said, I've got kids that have been failing math, they've been failing, you know, they kind of get pushed through the school system because it's all about being kinder and gentler to the kids, which is not being kinder and gentler to the kids mm -hmm. in the long run. But finally, after one lesson with me, and yeah, I'm good, but you know, <laughs> it was the dance, it was, she said, for the first time they understood what a multiple and what a factor was because they moved it they, in their bodies and they could see it in their, because we used the kids. I mean, that's exciting and you know, we need to, encourage that by you know supporting the funding by supporting these programs because it's hard to for teachers to have the time to put the arts into curriculum. Thank you.
No, I don't think it's difficult. It, in fact, science is not stuff. Science is a method of finding out stuff. So whether the stuff is social in nature, cultural in nature, uh, architectural, ceramic, uh, poetic, the method of science involves testing an idea critically. That can be done in any discipline. The problem we've got is the media often portrays science as stuff. You know, it's chemistry, it's physics, it's biology. It's, but those are, are the products of science, product, products of scientific inquiry. But it's just as valid to have scientific inquiry of social systems as it is uh, chemistry. So in a way, there's been a hijacking of language when it comes to science. People have been misled into thinking that science equals stuff rather than the method that allows us to learn about anything. You, there's the science of politics, believe it or not. I'm not sure Stephen Harper believes that, but <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I shouldn't introduce my views. Did you use the word dog? <laughs> <laughs> I do think there's a lot of things in the social sciences that are hard to test with the scientific method against the physical reality. I know in, with pharmaceutical things and health issues, you know, there's lawsuits all over the place because people, you know, can't test if this contributes to that cancer because there are so many different things going on. You know, we, we our, our science is still, you know, we have exploded with knowledge, but we still maybe know now how little we know mm -hmm. about, you know, especially about the human condition and the heart. And for me, uh, I'm very interested in human motivation. I, I remember as a kid, uh, the Biafran War was on and, and I was inundated with images of of little kids with bloated bellies, and and you know, my father was an agricultural economist. We had lots of discussions that we understood that we could, no problem, we can feed all of the people in the world. And it just, as a ten-year-old kid, it didn't make sense to me. It's like, well, why are we choosing not to? Mm -hmm. You know, like it's <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, and we just see that that kind of thing. You know, our our issues today, it's so much is a moral decay, a moral issue. Our, our choices as human beings that have to do with selfishness and greed and power, influence, all, all of those kind of things. So, um, and a lot of those, the, it's, it's, it, they're, they're huge, they're huge issues. So the, I think if, if, if the arts can, can discuss social issues, then I think maybe those questions that are, that we're having a hard time dealing with socially as a society uh, can maybe gain more traction. You know, maybe maybe that's it. It's not that this art is going to solve it, but it's maybe it's going to condition our hearts to to become more compassionate, to become more open, to become more aware. Um, because I think we have a lot of good ideas. It's just not a lot of good choices. <laughs> Maybe one final question? Not quite a question, but I'd like sense. to just talk about a visual art uh, installation that I saw that was one of those epiphanies, and it was a corner of a gallery, and it was all filled with brightly colored wrapped candies. And you were invited to take one of those away. Each of those candies represented an eight and every day, there were more candies added to the class. I've still got that candy, it's been 15 years. <laughs> and the power of that one simple gesture, and a very simple explanation was, I don't know, can you, that's a teaching moment? I don't know, it was extraordinary. But art is incredible in that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thanks to our panelists here for the interesting discussion, and thanks to you, the audience, who also contributed.
Well, I, I, this is one of uh, the weekend's unexpected pleasures uh, to, to be able to participate in, uh, in, t in this uh, discussion. Um, um, my early career was as a scientist. Um, I uh, spent two years in the Antarctic uh, doing research. Um, and if you'd asked me before I went, I would have said I had not one artistic bone or poetic bone in my body. Um, but if you spend two years in a place where there are essentially no community except what you make, then you quickly find that uh, what you make is, is not uh, science, but, but uh, poetry. And um, uh, we learned to sing, and we learned to put on plays, and mm -hmm. uh, we, we learned to, to draw. And uh, I think that speaks to, to the human condition. So thank you. Mm -hmm.